Hello and welcome to another Q&A session for this iteration of STEM Learning's Manager Behaviour for Learning. Today we are very lucky to be joined by John Bailey, who has in one form or another been involved with behaviour and behaviour management strategies for, for the last four decades. So welcome, John. Four decades, I like the sound of that. Um, before you, um, actually I don't like the sound, but <laughs> before you... Before we look at the first question, I just want to make a, a general point because I really enjoyed uh, reading all these questions, but I also picked up a lot of stress and strain and anxiety coming off. You know, that, that fear that I think might be deep in every teacher's heart that one day they're just going to tell us to go away and not listen to us anymore. And I think I wanted to make a general point and follow it up with a general tip. The general point is that all the stuff that's being taught on this course making sure that children understand the routines, they have clear expectations, you're acknowledge, acknowledging them when they do the right thing, um, you're using scripts when, when, when the going gets a little bit rough, you know how to make contact with parents. All these things work. It's all good practice and excellent stuff to know. But there will be outliers. There are some children who take longer uh, to pick it up. It's not a it's it's not an overnight miracle, um, and I think that we really need to understand that in a deep way. One of the thing one of the reasons to press on is that all people mirror each other's behaviour. So some children who you think are never going to change, they change because they see the others changing. It's it's just human nature. And I was just talking to uh, listening to a talk recently um, about someone saying there are also going to be some more challenging children in schools. Uh, schools are increasing starting to have to do the work of social service departments and we need to bake that into what we're doing here's an idea it's it's half term now and when you go back after half term one of the things that you might want to do is just find a second have a mini meeting with your class wait for that kind of foundation period moment when they're sitting and looking pleased to see you uh, and just do a little three-part trick tell them how pleased you are to see them and, and say something positive about what they did last half term we got really good at or you got much better at then name a thing that you'd like them to get even better at um, and I think this half term we're going to become total experts on transitions and I know it's going to work so let's get on with it so you've got that little three-part structure there and as well as being a reminder uh, of, of where you all are and what you're doing. Um, it also gives you a little bit of script that you might need to use with one or two individual children. So that was really my starter for 10. Brilliant. Thanks, John. That's a, um, a great start in the session, and I agree with everything you said. Brilliant. Um, so let's get into the questions. Um, and for question one, there are a number of people asking a very similar question around managing the behaviour of, of particular individuals who, who regularly misbehave. Um, so Holly, Alan and Carl Ota have all have a similar question. Alan mentions a child who is very negative about himself and, and quick to escalate things. And he wants to know how to quickly mitigate against that so it doesn't escalate into a, in a ser serious problem. And Holly's question is related. She is the person who people call on in school to, when, when their children are removed. And she sees the same students time and time again who are regularly rude, defiant and lie. And they both wondered if you had any advice on this. Well, yes, I do. But first of all, student support, um, it can be a dog's job uh, because what you're doing is going around picking up children uh, with whom the teacher has already lost it or the other way around. So you do spend quite a bit of your time padding around the corridors talking to difficult children. Just before we talk about what you do then, I greatly admire those schools that have patrol systems and use the patrol system to head off difficult children at the pass. If you know that if you know that Sally is likely to kick off uh, period three, uh, year seven, not a bad idea to have someone from outside drop in to help have her settle down and going because we can't do this stuff on our own uh, and it needs a system. Um, it is vexing when young people show their worst side. You know, I, I noticed I can hear the feeling there when they're regularly rude, defiant and lie. Well, they well, they do. They're they're they're. Um, uh, they're feeling bad about themselves and they, they show it off by being bad, feeling bad about you. So sticking to the script is really important. Um, for me, I think that a really important part of the script of children outside the classroom is just to get them to show you a little bit of the work uh, that they're doing, um, which they 
surprisingly often they won't have understood they won't have read it it's been a blur in front of them and then rehearse their re-entry into the room show me how you're going to talk to mr parker are you going to tell him you're sorry yeah sorry sir but let's do it again i'll pretend i'm mr parker show me really how you're going to do it in there because one of the most important ways of getting on with teachers is to good, give them good eye contact and say sorry uh, like you mean it so that's the kind of work we're doing when we're going around outside the classroom. But this child, um, like like some of the others that have been mentioned here, uh, or these children, some of them will need individual plans. Um, and I see that you're part of a student support department and you're surrounded by people like like ear heads and, and, uh, and form teachers. Um, and what a plan involves, it doesn't need to be terribly complicated but it really suggests a replacement uh, meeting uh, sorry a replacement behavior so all meetings are basically three steps uh, you meet and greet the student and give them some reason to think that you're pleased to see them because it's a waste of time standing in front of children uh, wagging your finger at them in fact many of them are used to it and they put their heads down and go away i know this because i used to be naughty at school um, and then you need to explain what the replacement behavior is that you want to see. Um, maybe rehearse it with them, uh, get their feedback, and then sum up um, on an optimistic note. Um, uh, such a plan may involve some positive and negative consequences. Do remember with consequences, um, they need to be light but certain. That's really the issue. They need to happen. Um, now, of course, this can get on and get more complicated when we're when we're working with special needs, um, and you you may well be working with other staff and parents. But I think we need to, from time to time, review what we're doing with these young people, um, and as well as having those scripts for just outside the classroom door, it's it's useful to the child, and also it's useful to you if you know you've got people you can you can go to and say, yeah, Thomas was out the classroom six times this week. We've got to do some thinking about what's going on behind there. Um, what was the next one? It's, um, hang on, I'm clicking my, um, yeah, the child who's very, very negative, the one who, who you yeah, know, the short fuse little boy. Um, I know that child. Um, uh, I've, I've seen schools handle this in all sorts of ways. I've seen secret signals between teachers and children. So after I've had a little talk with you, um, I might be saying, Thomas, I think I know when you're about to blow. Um, I'm going to come by and have a quick word with you. I might even give you a tap on the desk um, so that other children uh, can't see what's going on. But it's when you and I look at each other. And if you give me that little bit of eye contact, then we can decide what to do. One of the things that we might do is put you in a different uh, part, back of the room. Um, I'm, I must say, I, I'm not much in favour of sending children out of rooms, uh, but I'm greatly in favour of departments having plans so that I can park a child next door um, if I think that that child needs a breather uh, from the uh, immediate uh, environment around them. This child, this child here on the short fuse and um, another child who's coming up in the um, next question. Yeah, you know, the minute you settle them down to work, he puts his hand up. Yeah, what am I going to do, miss? What have I got to do? And those, um, those, 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 those children who you know are going to do that are an absolute I'm afraid they're a pain in the neck as far as your lesson planning is concerned at the beginning. I was working with a teacher last term. We used to do rather long introductions at the beginnings of lessons. Um, and I think the children got a little bit bored with the length of the introduction. Um, but then after he'd say, he'd say, right, carry on, go on working. And he'd stand there at the front of the room looking at them. And the children would look up and they'd see the target. And they'd immediately start asking for explanations about what to do. And one of the plans that he and I uh, worked out was after you set the work move quickly to the back of the room um, and it was very interesting to see children looking up and all they can see on the whiteboard is what's to be done and no teacher in sight uh, and so 90 percent of them uh, got their heads down and got on with the work and from the back of the room you can you can spot the Thomases and people who are going to jump up and need help and you can glide up behind them like a waiter in an expensive restaurant say ah oh, Thomas I see you need a little bit of help with your work so all that stuff is um, all that stuff is is classroom tactics 
Yeah, I really, really like that last point around um, almost removing yourself from the situation because that also, uh, in my experience, helped you spot the the poor be- or the, the behaviour that might happen as well because you kind of take yourself out as a teacher but also keep an eye on every- everything that's going on. It's a really good uh, tip there. And, and on the first one around um, spotting an issue before it occurs, you know, it's really good practice to have... Um, someone within each year group to to spot if someone's coming in you know leo doesn't look like he's um in best you know best fettle today can someone keep an eye on him and have that on call to go to those lessons before an issue happens and 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 just and just nip it in the bud before it happens and that's real good practice that uh, i've seen work as well so yeah thanks for that yeah that's really great yeah yeah we're going to move on to question two um, and Anna asks a question about having a way to ensure you as a teacher are calm and are addressing the behaviour and not the child um, and she's addressing the use of a script element part of the course. She asks what would be a good mantra to repeat to yourself personally to make sure that in a heated situation you can stay focused on your ultimate goal which is to address the issue and not to sever the relationship you've already built. Well, I, I really like this question. Um, and, and you're right to refer to the script because you get in there and say, I have, I have no choice. Um, you, you know, I've asked you three times and now you need to. Wow, it's not fair. Um, up goes the balloon. Um, and I think the issue here is to really understand what's going on. The reason why we have slogans like don't take it personally and blame the behavior, not the child, is that um, – What happens in a lot of human interaction, and especially in intense places like schools, is that we tend to mirror behavior. So if a child turns around and is spitting angry with us, um, bang, our adrenaline gets released, um, mentally our fists go up, um, and if we're not careful, in two seconds it's quite difficult to tell the difference between ourselves and the uh, uh, and, and and the angry child because your dander's up. It's it's very difficult to control. But the issue here is that if we start leaking our dislike and our fear, then the situation then, then the situation uh, turns into a spiral, uh, and we're absolutely we're absolutely stuck with it. So we don't take it personally is absolutely right and what we need is mantras that are good for us i used to think uh, that there was a a long time when i worked in pru's i used to say to myself this child is going to trust me and like me but he just doesn't know it yet Uh, and it allowed me to think (laughs) it allowed me to think aha this is going to be a two or three month job i also used to remember to do things like um um unfold my arms uh, cross my arms in front of me and stand back a bit just you know just remember what i look like you know try not to look like a huge angry potato uh, looming in front of the child and i i worked in one school with a, an ex nun who was used to be absolutely fabulous with angry children um, and when i asked her, when i asked her how she referred to them she said i like to think about my special mysteries so she had a yeah you know, she had a little label that she put on when it was going on and i want to and I hope I hope this is an inspiring story. Uh, I worked in a PRU, the, the, the leader of which, uh, uh, the head was a woman. And one morning we were all standing in the front hall and a, a little boy called Ricky came and said, good morning, miss. And she said, good morning. And uh, he said, you know, what I think you are, miss. And she said, no. And he said, and then he used the C word. And there was a kind of shocked gasp of staff standing around her. And what did she say? She said, Ricky, to me, that's water off a duck's back. But for you, it's two minutes in the timeout room. Off you go. Do you see what's going on there? Um, you know, he hasn't got the reaction he wanted. She's got an absolutely perfect bit of script. Uh, it's water off a duck's back. And if you want to know more about that, there's there's quite a few books on on non-defensive language. So if children are effing and blind, I'm, I'm very interested in what you have to say. Do you think you could say it um, in, in, in a way that doesn't involve um, all those swear words? Thank you very much. So a lot of it is having the script, but deep down is understanding that our job is not to mirror the behavior. Brilliant. There were some really good um, tips and, uh, on that one. Yeah, and I always find, uh, and I think from what you said, you agree, is uh, just take the emotion out of it. And no matter what's being thrown at you, it's not personal. Don't get emotionally involved. Always be calm. And 
yeah, exactly what you're saying. Recognize the way you're standing. Recognize the way you're addressing them. Because most of the time, um, they're wanting a reaction and they enjoy that angry reaction from a teacher. So, yeah, just always be aware of that. That's such a good point. If 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 we realised how rewarding an angry spitting teacher is, it would, it would help us enormously not to do it when we feel reduced to it. Exactly, exactly. Okay, we're going to move on to question three. So, um, question three is about working with parents and especially challenging parents. Um, Louise, Charmaine and Daniel have uh, similar questions about parents not being particularly helpful in helping to deal with uh, the poor behaviours of their child. Um, so w one of them mentions parents don't have the time to support or are in denial of their child's poor behaviour or they don't have control at home and they use the wrong um, approach to discipline. So Louise states, I like using positive approach with students, but one of my greatest hurdles is when dealing with parents who deal with their children's behaviour in an appropriate negative way. Um, so any advice on working with challenging parents, John? Uh, well, I've got a, f a few ideas. There's just one thing I, I mentioned that I worked for quite a long time in a PRU. And um, I think one of my fears when I took up the job was I was going to meet lots of, this is this is absolutely my bad. I thought I'd meet lots of violent men who'd come in with their sleeves rolled up and say, what do you do to my Alfie? Do you, know, do you want your head kicking in? Uh, and I, I was very nervous about it. Um, but I soon found out that wasn't the case. Sometimes people would come in and bluster, but once you'd said a few diffusing words, you'd very quickly realize um, that they're often at their wits end too. They don't know what to do. And, um, and they're also being reminded of bad experiences um, that they had in school. Um, there was a wonderful program, um, uh, I think it was done by Lee Cantor and Succeeding with Difficult Students. And he used to talk about key messages. And the key message, well, so so you meet and greet. Uh, I, I'm very pleased to see you. Uh, you know, the, some maybe someone shouting. So I I understand what you're saying, but if you sit down, I'm sure we can find a solution to this. No, I know what you're saying, but I'm sure we can find a solution to this. Now let's talk a little bit about what's, ha what's happening. And then in the course of that conversation, you weave in some key messages. One key message is you're the most important. Per I'm so glad you're here. You're the most important person in your child's life. You're the most important person in Susan's life. And you'd be surprised at the number of people who say to you, I wish you'd tell Susan that because she doesn't appear to know it. And you can say, I know, I know, I understand. It's, you know, bringing up a teenager is really difficult, but you're the most important person in your child's life. The other reason why I'm glad you've come in here is, is that, I, th I think we need to work together to succeed. What we, We've got to find a way um, of, of working together. And I don't care if it's if it's been me phoning you on a more regular basis. Um, I don't care if it's you coming in from time to time. Um, I don't care if it's me sending you a note and, and, and you arranging to, uh, uh, to give her a certificate when she does the right thing. And by the way, what do you do at the moment when she does the right thing? Uh, and, and then the third message was, we need to work together because it's Susan's future. Um, I wanted to go to college. I think she's got a good chance of doing, uh, of, you know, realizing her idea of being uh, whatever it is. Um, but she doesn't stand much of a chance of that if she if she stays on a track to exclusion um, uh, and further trouble. And that's what she's doing unless unless we work together. And and. Everybody has their own kind of exp uh, script for this. But I, no, I, th I think you probably know Paul because you spent, you've spent a career uh, doing this kind of work. But you've got to get into a flow when you're talking with parents and assure them that you're on the child's side. And, and incidentally, when we, um, you know, when we talk about difficult parents, um, try going to a, try going to a, a, a parenting group and hear them talking about difficult teachers. You know, they, <laughs> it's, it's. It, it's one of those conflict situations. The, both sides think the same thing as each other, uh, and we have to step across the lines. Incidentally, the parenting group that I ran for quite a long time had a module on um, on aggressive behaviour. And you know one of our fantasies is that um, yeah, we're, we're frightened of um, sending a note home in case a child gets bashed by their parent. Well, it's a legitimate fear, and it does sometimes happen. But one of the things I learned in those classes is that Every parent I met remembered with regret and remorse every time they'd hit a child. They'd say, oh, my 
days yeah, I was in a supermarket, this was happening, that was happening. I so wish I'd been able to think of something else to do. So we need to think hard about our attitudes towards parents. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that one, John. Um, the only thing I would add to that is uh, very similar about sticking to the script is I always started with this idea of we are a team and uh, we all want the same thing for this child, trying to get them on side as quickly as possible. So I used to always mention the idea of a triad. So as a teacher, as, as the parent, as the child working together as a team, because we're all working towards the same goal, which is ultimately to have a successful um education well well in this building so yeah lovely thank you for that um okay question four um is about balancing of your time between managed behavior and time spent with the the children in the class who are you know the well-behaved quiet ones so catherine asks whilst i am fully uh, invested in the positive approach there is no doubt that it is time consuming and at times exhausting particularly when you have a number of students in the class who require quite a lot of your attention in any given class my question is how do you balance the behavior management side with giving help to those students who really need it on the learning sides of things you know the quiet unassuming children who want to learn but struggle to understand and need guidance okay now if we get this one right uh, you and i will win a nobel prize for um for, for classroom management but a lot of this is around classroom craft let me just share a particular bee in my bonnet first which is that if the if we as a profession have a fault it's because we talk too much um and i expect you've seen all those books of research that say that you know children's talk should take up about 80 70 80 percent of the time in the classroom but you go into the average classroom and we're explaining and re-explaining and talking our heads off and taking far too long over it and i in my well certainly it's true of me that that, that, that when i that when I do that, it's it's anxiety when I'm talking. I've got the idea that nothing much can go wrong. Um, so I think that's just one thing. Listen to the way we're teaching. What we're meant to be doing is not explaining everything under the sun. Uh, we're meant to be creating situations where children can grapple with a task or an exercise and reach a conclusion uh, which we want them talking about that's kind of one of the central things that, that we've learned from assessment for learning and all that and once children are released on a task you have much more opportunity to circulate um, around the room and then what are we doing when we're circulating around the room um, there are lots of little craft techniques. One of my one of my favourites is um, it's called command praise times three. Every time you give out an instruction, nod or smile at a, a young person who's who's carrying it out. So that means that you're um, uh, that, that you're acknowledging appropriate behaviour. Well, every time you give a command, that must be about 150 times a lesson, um, and so you're changing um, your your language flow. One of the things that I notice uh, about teachers who are really good at this is they give really a rapt attention um, to children who are doing the right thing or answering a question. So if you're answering a question, Paul, I'm looking at you, and I don't know if you if the camera is large enough. If you know, something else happens somewhere else, and I put I put up a hand like that. That means I know what's going on over there, but. I'm really still intent on talking to Paul. And, and you see lots of really good teachers um, using those kinds of uh, 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 gestures. Also, there's, there's nothing wrong with a teacher talking across the classroom, and you need to do it. Um, but the most effective messages, um, I like this little term, are ear messages. Um, yeah, I might I might see someone someone who I think needs putting on straightening out of the back of the room but I finish what I'm saying here and I make my way across to that child and then like the murmuring waiter again I get down and I say Paul I can see you're having an interesting conversation but it would be much more interesting if you picked up that pen and we got on with the work um, uh, and whenever we can do that we're, we're, we're bringing we're bringing uh, the the tension down in fact while i'm on my way over to the person who's misbehaving at the back of the room i might just alter course a bit because i might see someone close to him who's doing the work right and i might come over to them and say charles great job here i said look you finished a whole paragraph here and i can i can do a bit of reinforcement on what the um on what the child next year has done and 
what I find is use, usually uh, when you do that, uh, the target child sort of gets the message uh, and carries on. So all this, all this stuff circulating um, the classroom using ear messages, proximity, proximity praise. What it's demonstrating is how to get the teacher's attention. Um, and one of the phrases I love is, children are going to get your attention one way or the other. So you might as well start modeling um, the right way to get your attention um, instead of obliging them with, um, with, with, with firework displays at regular intervals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in all the notes I had, um, you, you've mentioned um, a book that really changed my teaching um, early, earlier in my career was Teach Like a Champion, and a lot of the a lot of the techniques you've mentioned are um, are, are mentioned in that in, in that book. So if anyone is interested in in hearing some more of those techniques, a great book is the Teach Like a Champion. Yeah, great, great. Um, okay, moving on to question five. Um, a question five is another classroom strategy question, um, and your next point is is this. I understand we should be careful with threatening, but if poor behavior continues, there should be a consequence. What I do now is that, uh, in this case, I write down the name of the child on the board as a last warning, and if the poor behavior still persists, he or she will get a cross behind the names, uh, with into their name, sorry. Uh, in one of the videos you say we shouldn't write names on the board as it's embarrassing for the student. So the question is, how should I give them a last warning in your opinion and what should the consequences be? Well, I mean, I've got a flat out opinion about it, which is you know, keep a notebook or a clipboard uh, and, and write the names um, down in there uh, and keep it lying on your desk. I think there's a re there is a bit of an issue uh, with sticking sanctions up on the board. Um, uh, some some children don't like it. Uh, parents get upset if they hear that their child's name um, is being written up on the board. And of course, when you're trying to if you're trying to establish yourself with the class. Um, uh, it can be a bit of sport um, getting your names on 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 the naughty board, um, and I think we're all familiar with that that desperate feeling you know, halfway through a lesson. <laughs> there, there are already fourteen champions' names up on the board, and they're spoiling for another go. So I think I, I, I think keep it um, keep it really uh, low level. Uh, and the other thing is, um, you know, choose your fights when you're putting up consequences. Um, you know, diffusing and deflecting. Uh, I think, um, I remember someone was telling me a story the other day. Um, you know, I said I was going to give this talk. And they said, well, you should be like Jane. And I said, I said, well, what's so good about Jane? And they said, well, she's famous for having turned around one of the most difficult classes in school. And how does she do it? When Before she took, she she, she got set on the class because everyone knew uh, that, that, um, that, that they, they were, they were difficult, uh, and she did. She did three things. One is she rang every parent um, before she started the class and introduced herself and said she was looking forward to working with them. She set a target of six positive phone calls home a week, uh, so that the children were competing uh, to get those phone calls. And then this is a thing I, I, I don't even look at your expression when I tell you this, Paul. Um, uh, she also spent about forty quid. A month of her own money um, on making sure that she had a really good rewards box in the room. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that she had them absolutely eating out of her hand. They thought she was the best thing in, in uh, since sliced bread. And the, um, uh, the class had been split in half, yet the other half carried on terrorizing the school. Now, I I don't think, I, I don't know how many people would be wanting to put in that kind of effort, but it but there are two things about that story. One is it does it does show you um, uh, what a determined, consistent approach can do. Uh, in fact, it reminds me of a piece of advice I once got from an experienced. I said, what, what would you want to tell NQTs? And she said, I'd want to tell them in their first half term, they have to behave like friendly psychopaths. They follow up everything. So there's Jane giving out her rewards. And she, she rarely set detentions she, she tried to make sure that her sanctions were given out as infrequently as possible but when when they were she stuck to her guns you couldn't talk your way out of a detention with jane uh, even if she had to get on a plane and follow you on your holidays um you were going so she got the she got the reputation um of being the teacher um who who, who, who nailed it um when, when when a sanction was involved 
Yes, yeah, so, and, and that's it. So, and I suppose the last thing is, um, I'm not happy to do it. It's their responsibility to respect the class rules. Well, yes, so it is. I sometimes, I, I know that feeling of, oh, Lord, am I really going to give out a detention for this? But the way I sometimes used to help myself with this was to think, if this was my son sitting with his feet slung sideways out of the desk, staring out the window and not doing any work, uh, what would I want to happen to him? Um and it wouldn't be someone quavering away from giving him a sanction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that that main point around um, putting the name on the board and, and becoming an, either an embarrassment or, as you quite rightly said, what I, what I experienced as well was it was a game to a lot of... Um, Mostly the boys, the boys kind of then seeing what your names on. Why is your why is my name not up there yet? And it, it became like a bit of a challenge to get your name on the board. So having your own sort of system in place where you know who's on their last warning, and the child knows that they're on their last warning via a quiet word in their ear. Or sometimes I used to put a small card on the desk so only the, myself and them knew. But everyone Good. else knowing is not is not the way. It's just between you and that child, I, I would say. Yeah, yeah, famous. Lovely. Question six um, is about strategies for students who point black refuse. And we know we all know those students and how, how challenging they can be. But Denise asks, I realise that I can't make a pupil do what I ask of them without their willingness to do so. I would like to know how to proceed when a pupil point blank refuses to do what I have asked them. Uh, after I've used the interventions learnt. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. I know that feeling. I was glad to see, thankfully, this has not happened to me yet. I'm, I'm very pleased to see that, Denise. Yeah. Um, and I think I'd like to say that it's not going to happen to you um, very much. Um, uh, and it also, it also taps into a really deep fear that, that all teachers have. You know, one day I'll tell them what to do and they'll say, no, mate, we're going fishing. And, and they, you know, our authority will, will collapse completely. Um, but I, I've, I've never heard of that happening. Um, so the, the first thing is, is not to catastrophize about it. And if a child backs off and point blank refused, then we back off and think, you know, Sammy, you're making a bad decision here. Um, uh, we'll be coming back to it later. Um, it's a little bit about a little bit like tactical ignoring. Um, we're, we're we're buying time in the immediate moment because we know that we're going to follow it up um, uh, later on. And there are other things that we can do. Um, yeah, I think if, I think all all heads of year are, and uh, are, are familiar with the um, the child who is absolutely stone cold refusing to budge and so you say to the rest of the class right we'll all go to the library and so the, you take away the audience and the rest of the class troop out of the library and there's um uh, and and there's 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 sally or ahmed sitting there not looking quite so brave uh, and a couple of adults can come in and do that i've, I've got to say that um working can't remember now five or six years in a central London PRU. I think I used that tactic three times, um, max. Um, and I think, um, yeah, and there was one, there was one last, there was one time I remember when um, I said, right, we're all going to move. And I was absolutely thwarted because the target child decided to go with them as well. <laughs> I couldn't remember that. What on earth am I going to do feeling now? But I think the really important answer to this question is, is, is buy yourself a bit of time. Um, and you know, don't get involved in that, 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 that slogging process. Um, you know, you, you may want, if it goes on, it's really badly disrupting a, a lesson. You may need a call out team, but if it's Thursday afternoon and you send for call out, um, you know, you might as well you might as well pray for Christmas um, because it's not going to happen. So sometimes that idea of you're making a ch bad choice, Adam, will come back to this later on, and there you go. Yeah, I think that's the key point: is um, walk away from the situation, don't give them the audience, and let them have time to think about what they're doing. Usually, if you give them the time, they they do just kind of okay. I'll I'll, I'll go where where I need to go. Um, I have had twice the situation. Um, in my time as assistant head, the, the the removal of a class, but I haven't had 
the chair will move with the class. That's a new one on me. Yes, he's probably he's, he's probably going to go and become prime minister or something, isn't he? <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Um, okay, question seven uh, is from Chris, uh, which is which is an interesting one about time management. So Chris asks, I would like advice on how to manage my time to make uh, relentlessly following up always possible and habitual. <laughs> Well, I think um, I think two things about it. One is I would repeat that story. Yeah, that that, um, that uh, it was a, it, she was a a lead teacher when I asked her for some advice for um, NQTs on establishing yourself with the class, and and she said really only half jokingly. She said when you're first starting, you do have to be a bit of a psychopath, uh, and I said, well, what exactly do you mean? Well, it was in the context of a conversation when I'd gone into the room and and uh, and she was a, a CDT teacher, and there was an absolutely fabulous class going on. It was like being it was like being a, in a design lab in some in, in 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 some posh studio somewhere, and I said. What a brilliant class! What you, have you managed to achieve all this? And she said something like, "Brilliant, be damned." She said at the beginning of the year, she said this lot had to be marched out and back in from the playground six times before I got them to come into the class the the way I want and get them sat down um, the way I want. Uh, that's relentless, isn't it? Um, and I think that when you're when you're establishing or reforming a class. Um, uh, then you might have to do that. And that relentless following up needs to be planned. And you, you probably want some backup um, when you're doing it. So that's one thing. But then it goes on to say, always possible and habitual. Well, relentlessly following up, which by the way means with positives as well as with um, as, as well as with negatives. Um, I, the first comment that I wrote down here was choose your battles. Um, it, uh, if, if, you're, if you're going for detentions or or if you've done tactical ignoring and you need to follow up. Um, incidentally, can I just say a word or two about tactical ignoring? Um, the idea is, I don't know, you ask a child to move from one part of the room to another, and, and they oblige, but as they're going, they mutter something under their breath that sounds suspiciously like it has to do with your ancestry. Um, but you're kind of on the spot, aren't you? Because if you go chasing after, they say, what did you say? What did you say? Nothing, sir. So, yeah, it's a difficult situation. Um, so you let it go. Uh, and kids, and you might have kids saying, aren't you going to do something about it, sir? And you say, you know, that's between me and Ryan. On with your work. Um, but you do have to meet up Ryan afterwards and say, Ryan, I really appreciated uh, the fact that you... Um, uh, that you chose to move this afternoon. I didn't quite hear what it was you said under your breath, but I, I don't think I liked it, and I don't think you meant it as a compliment. So in future, I'd be really pleased um, if when you follow an instruction, you just follow the instruction and leave out the running commentary. And, 90, and two things about that. One is that 99 times out of 100, they'll say, right you know, once you've got them on their own um, and with the audience um, uh, out of the way. And also, you're not wasting your time telling them off because um, relentlessly following up sounds like you're going to be wandering around the school giving um, giving children lectures. It's not like that. It's uh, there are two or three there are two or three children you want to get to before the before the end of the school day, and and have that have that quick word. Does that correspond with your experience? Yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, what I would. Um add to that is it, it's time well spent um, especially it, as you're establishing yourself within the within the school so um uh, as i think your your example showed at the beginning there was a class where she marched them out six times and she got them back in um, that's been relentless at the start but it pays dividends so it's not you won't always have it won't always eat up your time if you do it right from the very very beginning is, is what i would say and i think the key thing is never threaten something that, that you won't do <laughs> that is just beyond your means uh, of, of time management so always you know always do what you say you're going to do therefore don't overshoot what you would do is what i would say as well to that yeah couldn't agree more okay moving on to the next question paul has a follow-up question about the course around recognition being more effective than rewards on their own uh, he states um 
I found the articles on rewards and sanctions profound, and it has given me much food for thought. Um, I would be interested to know what the course directors and moderators' views are on this, please. If there is a body of evidence that clearly shows that reward and sanctions is ineffectual or worse still counterproductive in the long term, then why does the profession continue with this practice? I think that's probably the question of the year. Um, and like most questions of the year, um, there isn't a clear answer to it, but we can find some some guidelines. I was at a conference a few years ago, uh, along with a, a, another name that you might have heard of, Terry Hayden, because I noticed he's in some of the STEM reading materials. And a, a chap gave us a talk, neither of us can remember his name, uh, but he said, I'm, there was about there was an audience of about 200. He said, I'm going to divide you into two halves, pointing down the middle of the corridor. And he, and he said, uh, uh, and I'm going to put a problem up on the board to solve in a moment. And this half of the room, anyone, if, if you're amongst the first three to put your hands up, you'll get a, you'll get some, you'll get a sweet. And he held up a pack of the sweets. And he said, that side of the room, uh, put your hands up when you get the answer right. But I'm not going to give you anything. I just want you to solve the problem. Uh, do you understand what to do? Yes, go. And uh, up on... Uh, up on the, um, you know, I want, I wanted to, I wanted, I, I was on the side that could earn sweets, so I was quite, I was quite motivated. So he, he, um, he, he then put up a, it was a, it was a fairly simple sort of algebraic sort problem um, that you know you, you could do it with mental arithmetic in probably two or three minutes, but I didn't have time to do it because the first three hands went up on the other side of the room, and um, and. We, we all oohed and aahed a bit, and he laughed, and he said, I've done this demonstration all over the world. He said, I've never had to give away a single suite uh, because the side that are doing it to win the prize are always slow, uh, are always slower than the others. And that's what we've learned um, about mental processing, uh, that people need to be focused on the problem and not something else. Um, and that made, a, as you might imagine, that made a big impact on me. And it made me really review and, and, and try to re-understand what we'd learned uh, you know, from assessment for learning. Do you remember in the original Medway experiments at the beginning of assessment for learning uh, that they, they divided some groups, uh, some were given numeric remarks, sorry, numeric marks after they'd achieved in maths tests, and some were given verbal marks. And the ones with numeric marks, it didn't improve their performance at all. In fact, sometimes went backwards. But the one with verbal marks or with verbal comments that showed them what to do, it produced dramatic improvement. And so that's the whole of assessment for learning now, um, really, is, is you show children what to do, how to do it, and show them how to assess it for themselves, and then uh, 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 look at their assessments and tell them what to do next. Um, and and that, would, that would make the chap... Uh, that, that I was talking about just now, very happy. So I think that when it comes to um, rewarding academic work, that's sort of become my my lodestar. But when it comes to pro-social and behaviour, I think the situation is a little bit different um, because what we know is that rewards work very well if everybody in a school, staff and students, believe in them. Um, and you sometimes go to schools where they're dishing out points and prizes and People are standing up in assemblies and being uh, um, and, and being congratulated. I've even seen schools where um, you know, where the head takes it upon themselves and congratulate teachers in assemblies. And so there's a, and so I think it's symbolic. It's a way of saying we're really pleased to see you and we're pleased with what you've done and, and you're part of the community. You belong here. Um, uh, but equally, I've seen schools and I will bet you have too, where um, the rewards and sanction system quickly turns into a into a road to detention system and there's a little bit of if you give people a hammer they think every problem they've got is is a nail um, and so I think that the, the most important thing um, is the is the teacher's behavior rewarding do I look like I'm pleased to see you um, uh, do I do I acknowledge uh, when you're doing the task? And am I also very keen on effort? And I must say, I've never observed a lesson delivered by um, a smiling teacher uh, that's been a flop, someone who's glad that people are in the room and, and lets them know it. So to sum that up, because that was a, that was a real mouthful, wasn't it? Um, uh, the relationship between rewards and performance is very complicated, but 
if we're trying to create an atmosphere where pe people, where children feel welcomed and appreciated, then teacher praise, verbal praise, is probably the most important thing going. And if you're in a school where a reward system is working well and consistently, then then stay with it. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. Um, it, my personal experience is ch children respond well to the recognition of what they're doing at that point better than having a goal at the end of it. And I, in my personal opinion was what you often did with a reward system that g gave people trips away or, or, or um, you know, something at the end of it was you isolated the, the children who found behaviour challenging and kind yeah. of put them down the opposite path. I'm never going to hit that reward, so I'm going to be a bit naughty. Yeah. So it has a place if it works, I, I would say, as, as you've just met, uh, mentioned, John, but um, recognition of the child's effort there and then um, is, is far more, um, yeah, f works far more for me. Great. Well, I, I, hope, um, I, hope Paul, <laughs> I hope Paul found that useful. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I'm glad you answered it, not me. It was a very tough, tough question, wasn't it? Um, Okay, question nine, which I, I believe is, yes, it's the last the last question. Um, both Grace and Claire have questions relating to building relationships and rut routines when you only have children for a short length of time. So Grace works as a museum educator. Claire um, covers for other teachers. So I'll, I'll go with Claire's question, which is, I find behaviour management harder to manage during my PPA cover. Part of the problem is not having relationships which are strong, as if you are a class teacher. Are there any strategies to help with behaviour management when you're only with the pupils for an hour max each week? I think doing doing things like PPA cover is uh, is is really challenging, um, and I I've got three ideas about that. One is that um, I think that you need to have your own rules and routines. I, I know there's all this business of fitting in with um, yeah fitting in with what's habitual here. Um, uh, but, you know, supply teachers often wander and say, yeah, good day, my name is Miss Jones. But remember, we get on very well if, and then, yeah, my three golden rules are, and I'm very pleased to see that so-and-so is doing such and such, and so-and-so is doing such and such. So that's really, that's really the, the, um, the first thing. The second thing is um, uh, it's a good idea to have links with the regular teacher. And, and I know that can be a... Um, uh, when staff are really busy, that can be a bit of a pain, but comparing notes uh, so that the regular teacher knows what's going on and can give you tips um, on what's happening in the room, um, really important. And um, and then I'm, I'm a bit hesitant on the last one because it just depends on the situation in the school, but being able to drop in on the regular class when they're with their regular teacher, even if for 90 seconds, um, so that you're standing next to an established authority figure uh, and, and discussing with them. That's really important. But I, can I, and can I use that just to hop to grace? Because um, um, I learned a lot from thinking about this question. Um, but I, you know, when someone says, yeah, we, we only see students for two hours in a museum and we, and we only interact, you know, we interact with them very briefly. And I read this question and I got this help feeling, well, I thought, well, well I wonder how you do it. <laughs> but then, um, but then it, it all fell into place. But uh, I was playing tennis on Sunday morning and along came a, a coach um, with a group of, um, I, I know they're six-year-olds because I know the family across the road who sent their kids out. And they were on their um, the beginning of half-term tennis camp. And he had a bunch of children he was seeing for the first time in his life. And he said, good morning, everybody. I want you to line up with your toes touching the line. Yes, just touching the line. That's exa exactly what I want. So he got immediate immediate compliance with a kinesthetic activity. <laughs> And then he, um, he he asked them all their names, so they all got their personal bit of, 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 of recognition. Then he said, right, now we're going to run around the outside of the court. We're going to run around the outside of the court two times, uh, and we're going to do it with really good running action like this. And then he led them off. He gave them something to do right away. And I thought, of course, that's what you have to do when you're a, a, a museum teacher. You have a set of activities that, uh, that have a good level of base, and every time there's, a, there's that activity, there's the opportunity to recognise um, what's going on, um, and there's the opportunity to learn something about the children as well. Yeah, by the time they'd run around the outside of that court, twice he'd already got an idea about who to pair up with who for the next exercise and all that he had um now he had a kit bag with him and i didn't 
I wasn't able to stick around there long enough to watch what, what he was doing. But I'll bet it had a few um, stickers and prizes in there as well for the, 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 the top one of this and the top one of that. And then, uh, because I was worried about giving this answer, um, I talked to a friend of mine about it. And he said, well, that's it. He said the other thing about those kinds of you know, people who are in that situation is they have lots of bags of tricks. They have, you know, you know, different ways of dividing up groups. If one activity doesn't work, they turn another. They have the idea of it as being a performance, and they tweak it. Um, so you do something that worked well, didn't work well the next week, uh, and so on. Uh, you, you 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 try and you you take what you've got and just just work with it as you go along. And presumably, if you spent a year doing that, or if, if you and I were had, had to spend a year going around leading bunches of children around museums, we'd probably have uh, a whole bunch of. Um, devices like that up our sleeve you know children working in groups children going and introducing one item in a museum to another um uh a quick i don't know I'm, I'm making this up as i go along a quick sort think of five words to describe what a museum curator does um and we'd be thinking like maniacs wouldn't we because we'd be, <laughs> we'd be trying to solve this problem about how to grab their attention and and I expect Claire and Grace are both listening to this. I wonder if Claire's listening to this as well, because um, uh, doing PPA cover is a performance too, isn't it? And I wonder what happens when she walks into the room, how she announces herself, and um, it, you know, it's it's cover time this week. You never, I'm going to blow your socks off with the, with, with the um, ideas I've got for us to be working on today. So here's the first one, bang. Um, I think you, I'd, I think I'd find it exhausting, uh, but I think you've got to throw a lot of energy at it. And I hope that doesn't sound too lame, Claire. I think well, I, I think the main thing I would sum up is I, I, yeah, I've in, I've enjoyed watching um, Paul Dix's course, um, and it certainly it certainly ticked all the boxes as far as I'm concerned. I think um, I think two things really. One is I think behaviour management. I. I always like getting top ups on behavior management. And if I have a chance to go on a course, I go on it because, um, you know, you know, like someone in your position, Paul, you've, you've had a lot of pastoral responsibilities during your career. And, and at any particular time, you're using one box of tricks. Then you go along and look at a course on something. You think, oh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't done that for years and years. I'll, I'll add that to my armory. So I would say to, I would say to anyone you know, experimenting with this stuff, um, don't. After a while, behaviour won't become such a concern. There's a kind of there's a kind of Rubicon we cross as teachers. We're we're very anxious about behaviour. We get a lot of techniques under our belt, and then all of a sudden, it's the learning that's important, and designing a really good lesson and grabbing their attention becomes the main thing that preoccupies us. Um, but I think that, that from time to time, revisiting this stuff is really important, especially, and this will happen to you because all teaching careers now happen at the speed of light. You know, you're in one school where you're, um, you've established your authority and you, 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 strike, you strike respect into the hearts of, uh, of year 11 by raising your right eyebrow at them. And then you get given a new job and you go to the school where you've promised to rewrite the curriculum and take them into the 29th century. Uh, and you see a child doing something wrong, you raise your eyebrow at him and he's, <laughs> he chucks a stone at you or something. And you suddenly think, oh, they don't know me. The relationship isn't there. The trust isn't there. And you go back to command, praise, times three, writing, you know, the whole thing. Um, so it, it will always be good to have these techniques under your belt. Yeah, absolutely, and it's 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 almost just bringing those techniques to the forefront of your mind, and, and they do they do leave you. I mean, I've been outside of education now, um, or, or being inside a school um, for eighteen months, and you, you forget them. I've got a seven year old who who um, yeah, during lockdown was very challenging, and just 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 coming back to do these sort of question and answer sessions, and just re, sort of almost revising the techniques and stuff. To, to, to use on me seven year old was it was a really good thing to do so I, I absolutely agree just keep coming back to it keep reminding yourself of those techniques um and i think you'll be absolutely fine john i've thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed um uh, this question and answer session um and i thoroughly enjoyed your answers so thank you again me too thank you